can I just say thank you for being here on this freezing rain Sunday. Uh, I am grateful that you're here. For those of you who are online, we're grateful that you're joining us online as well too. Um, it wasn't easy to get to church today. And so thank you for your faithfulness and your discipline and just engaging that and let's see what the Lord wants to do this morning. As we continue our Parables and Perspectives series, for the past three weeks, we've been talking about lostness from Luke chapter 15. And Jesus told three stories about a lost sheep, coin, and sons. And today we want to flip the script, or Jesus flips the script, and he talks about finding things. Most importantly, finding him. So he talks about lost things, and that all comes out of the question of why are you hanging around with those people? As long as there's been people, there have been these people and those people. As long as there's been people. And so that's what's happening in that context, and Jesus corrects it. And then in this context, he's actually being asked some pretty difficult questions. He's being asked a series of if questions, and he, he answers them with seven parables, of which we're going to start with three today, and we're going to keep moving forward in Matthew chapter 13, but we're not going to go through in order. We're going to mess it around a little bit, all right? And so he's asked if questions. How many of you know that God is not afraid of hard questions? He's not afraid of difficult questions. He's not afraid of questions that, that we have to wrestle through. He's not afraid of those things. And so Jesus, as he is ministering and living and doing what he's doing, he's receiving lots of questions like, could it really be him? It can't be him. He's just a carpenter. He's just a stonemason. What does he know? He's from that town. Don't his brothers do that or his stepbrothers do that? Don't you know their story? Don't you know really how he came about? I mean, all these things are wrestling around who Jesus is. And then as he begins to minister, people are attracted to the miracles, but then when he gives the message, they're like, I don't know if I like that. So I like it when Jesus is a benefit to my life. I'm not quite so sure about when he's talking about giving stuff up to follow him. I don't know if I like that part. I like the miracles part. I don't like the message part. And so he's wrestling through those things. And then there are others who, when they look at what Jesus is doing, he's not moving fast enough for them. He's not doing what they think he should be doing. He's not kicking Rome out. He's not, you know, railing against injustice Though they, in, in their way, in which they can see it, he's not rallying an army. They're thinking swords, and he's talking seed. And so there's this wrestle on the inside. So they begin to grumble and ask questions. How many of you know that humans, we have a propensity to complain? You know, as I'm, I, listen, I'm a big, massive Ottawa Senators fan, and I've had a lot of complaining in my little heart this weekend, and I'd, I'd like a new owner. If Eric Carlson gets traded, I just want to say I'm on record that I'd like, I'd, I'd like a new owner. My little heart complains. But there's some larger questions that we have to talk about, not just like those questions. Um, those are good lobby questions, not platform questions. Here's a good one, though. Here's a question that Jesus was being asked. Uh, why does Jesus in the gospel... So, Jesus, why does it seem that it has so little impact on the world? If it's so powerful, why does it not seem like it's doing a whole lot of anything? Here's a great one. Uh, why do those who call you leader not follow your lead? In other words, well, we may not have a problem with you, but we've got a big problem with your followers. Because they're following you, but they don't look like you. They don't sound like you. They can't even seem to do what you do. So we've got a problem there. And then here's a big one, though. Here's a massive one that's still asked today. If you are who you say you are, and Jesus, you are who you say you are, why does earth look more like hell than it does like heaven often? That's a question he's being asked. If you're all powerful, if you're all knowing you're all powerful, if you're all knowing, then why didn't you stop that? If you're all powerful, then why did you allow that? All these questions he's being asked. And, if you're, and here's the big one. And if you're not going to do anything about that, why are you worthy of me following you? So it's from these are the questions that are pouring out to him. And it's from those questions we just summarize them, but it's from that space that he launches into talking about the kingdom of God. Now, we don't under, we don't, we live in a democracy, but we live in a democratic centralized country called Canada. We don't live in a kingdom. It's a dominion, but it's not a kingdom. I mean, it's a monarchy. It's got understanding of there. But how do you know that in Jesus' day, the king had absolute rule? So in their kingdom, they were final authority. What they say went. 
And so Jesus begins to talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven of which he's the king. And he begins to say, this is what it's like in my kingdom. This is what it's like. This is the way in which it was created to be. This is what it looks like. And so to answer the questions, Jesus tells three parables, two of which go together perfectly, and one feels like an oddball that we don't even know. Doesn't, why are you talking about that in this context? So he's going to talk about a field and treasure. Turn to the person beside you and say, I like treasure. How many of you remember Cracker Jacks? Kinder Surprise? Worst toys in the world, but they were just still excited. Right. Some of you, it's, it's still fortune cookies. Right. So over here, there's treasure. He's going to talk not only about treasure, but he's going to talk about a pearl of great price. So one treasure, one pearl, and then over here, we're going to get, it's going to get odd for a minute because he's going to talk about a net, one net. Okay. So one treasure, one pearl, one net. Let me read it, the three of them, and let's talk about them. But first, we're going to read them. They're not going to come on the screen. They'll come on a little bit later when we talk about them one by one. But let me just read them over you. He says, these three parables out of all those questions we just covered. So he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and then covered up. Then in his joy, everyone say joy. In his joy, he goes out and sells all that he has. And buys the field or and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Sold everything he had, bought the field. Sold everything he had for one pearl. You can see how those kind of go together. And then he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net, a singular net, that was thrown into the sea, and it gathered fish of every kind. Now watch Jesus pivot. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted good into containers, but they threw away the bad. And then he says, so it will be at the end of the age. Everyone say, at the end of the age. Okay, it's really important. At the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate evil from righteousness and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay? Three parables. Let's start here. A little tall. Perfect. Being found or treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found. Everyone say found. Just making sure you're with me on this uh, freezing rain Sunday. Which a man found and he covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. So the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found. Keep pulling on that world, on that word, which a man stumbles upon, which someone who wasn't looking for it finds it. Now, you and I, most of us, I would assume, have bank accounts. So if someone wants to give you money, uh, they can now do a little tap or a little e-transfer, and it's, it's, it's pretty simple. We have banks. Now, they had banking systems back then. They had money changers. They had all of those things. They had tax collectors. As long as there's been people, there's been tax collectors. So they had all of that back there as well. But one of the things that they didn't have, of course, is they didn't have the banking systems that we have today. And so oftentimes what people would do is if they owned a piece of property in this parable, a field, the one who owned the field would have an intricate map of where they had taken all of their treasure. 
and they would bury it in the field where they knew where it was, but to everybody looking out, what does it just look like? A field. It looks like nothing. It looks like something that doesn't have value because the value's not what can be seen. The value's what's hidden in the field. And so Jesus begins to articulate that the kingdom of God in our hearts can't always be seen with the natural eye. That when we look at each other's lives, we can't sometimes see what God is doing. We just look like fields. That it's not looking on the outside that you can see. It's the treasure that's on the inside. And so Jesus tells this story of treasure that is hidden in a field that this individual who wasn't looking for it in any way just simply stumbles upon it. And when he stumbles upon it, he finds it, and then what does he do? He covers it up. Why does he do that? Because he doesn't want anyone else to buy the field. He gathers all the money he has, cashes it all in so that he can buy the field. He's not interested in the field. He's interested in the He's interested in the treasure. He's interested in something deeper. He is interested in something more valuable than what just can be seen on the surface. And so the first thing that Jesus begins to say to the, those listening that day to the parables is again, the kingdom of heaven can't always be seen with the natural eye. You've got to look through eyes of faith to see it. Because if you just look on the outside, sometimes you're just going to see a field Sometimes you're just going to see something difficult. Sometimes you're just going to see an obstacle. Sometimes you're just going to see a storm. Sometimes you're just going to see another problem. But there is someone deeper on the inside of you who gives that more value. And the heart in this story for Jesus is he tells this parable of the buried treasure, saying that for some of us, we stumble into finding something of deeper value in who Christ is. The value of who Jesus is, is worth you and I giving or being willing to give up something to inherit something better. See, one of the central problems in North America is not Jesus. It's we want Jesus, but we're not willing to give anything else in our lives up in order to have the fullness of who he is. So we have this beautiful thing called synchronicity where everything just kind of gets meshed and pushed together, where we've got a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And in Revelation, Jesus is very, very clear. He says, I would actually rather you be hot or cold. Think about that just for a moment this morning. Jesus actually says, I would rather you be an atheist or a hot follower of me, but don't be lukewarm in the middle because it serves nobody any good. It doesn't serve you any good. And so in this, in this story that Jesus begins to tell, he's talking about the ultimate value that it is to grab hold of who he is. That he is this treasure. That he is right there in front of them. He's going to pay the ultimate price. But how many of you know there's a difference between the price that Jesus paid, but it still can cost us something. And we may be in a conversation and we go, now I have to say that I'm a follower of Jesus. And we begin to do something called count the cost. And the question we begin to wrestle with is, have we really grabbed the treasure or is it just about the field? What's our life really about? That's one of the parables that he begins to dive into. And in this, this text, he says, then in his joy, everyone say joy. In his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys his feet the field. There's something beautiful about grabbing hold of Jesus with all of our hearts, which is on the inside, not the outside of our lives, where transformation begins to happen. There is something beautiful that in the story that Jesus told, that once he knew there was buried treasure, everything that the man once valued, so everything that he valued before, when he discovers the treasure, now he's willing to say, this is more valuable than all of those things. He's not saying those things don't have value. He's simply saying, in comparison to the treasure that I've stumbled upon or that I have found, now in light of this treasure, those things don't seem as valuable. 
There's an old, old hymn that we've singing in church for a long time. When the things of earth grow strangely dim in light of His glory and His grace. There's this beautiful space in our lives of, you can't always see it on the outside, but sometimes there's this buried treasure that God's doing something on the inside. But one of the fruits He can begin to say is of a life that has come in contact with the treasure who is Jesus Himself. He said, you're now looking at your life saying, the things that I once valued, I don't value as much. So my life's not all about the field anymore. It's about the buried treasure. It's not all about what I can produce with my hands. It's about the one thing that my hands could never produce, and that is this buried treasure. Okay? That's what he tells this story of. Some of you are just absolutely praying. You're praying for those on the back wall. where That's our wailing wall. And we are praying for people to come to know him. We're lifting up names every single week. And when you're looking with your natural eyes, you're saying it's, it's a problem because they're not even searching. They're not even looking. Don't worry about it. The master knows how to bury treasure in their path. It's what he knows how to do. Sometimes, has anyone here ever stumbled into something good? Anyone ever... Some people, you are planners, man. You got a five-year plan, a seven-year plan, a 10-year plan. And then the rest of us, we just stumblers. Hey, while I'm here, I might as well, woohoo! hey, look at that. Oh, how'd you get there? I've got no idea. Where are you going next? I don't know. But I can see my next step and my next step. That's about it. But I'm just trusting Jesus along the way. My father tells that's his testimony. He just continues to stumble into the will of God. How many of you know sometimes when you look back and you see what God does in your life, you look back and you go, oh, thank you, Lord, that you didn't tell me you were going to do that. Because if you, if you would have told me then what you did now and all of those things, I would have messed it up. I just kind of kept taking another step, another step, another step, another step. How do you grow in Jesus? It's really simple. Make your next step an obedience step. That's it. That's it. Well, what? No, that's it. Make your next step. What about one after that? Don't worry about it. Just make your next one there. If you don't make the next one, you're not going to get to the next, next one. Just make your next step an obedience step. And trust the master is going to bury treasure all along your way. Trust him he's going to do it. That he's not just healer. He is savior. He is provider. He is all these things. And so sometimes when we look at what God is doing in our lives, it just looks like a field. Don't look at the field. Understand there's treasure hidden in the field. Sometimes it just looks like a problem, a circumstance. Don't just look there. Look a little bit deeper. Next. This one's he changes the variable. So this one, stumble. Perspective number two, he tells a story about pearls. It's about searching everywhere. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search. Everybody say in search. No search over here. Just stumble. Here, intentional search. I'm looking for something. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something in particular. There's something on the inside of my life that I may have a lot of things, but I don't have one thing. I don't have something. There's something missing in my life. There's something missing in our relationship, in our family, in our world, whatever it happens to be. There's something missing, and I'm looking for it that I'm willing to go on a search, and he uses the example of a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold, same variable, went and sold all that he had and bought it. And so it says that a merchant goes looking first for fine pearls, plural. But then he finds this one pearl, this singular pearl of great value. This singular pearl has more value than all the other pearls pearls. It is an ultimate pearl. It is not just a good pearl. When he finds this one pearl, this, having this one thing is more valuable than having all of these things. This one ultimate thing is more valuable than a lot of good things. And there in our world today, there's a lot of people who are searching for good things. They are searching for happiness. They are searching to love and to be loved. They are searching for success. They are searching for identity. They are searching for acceptance. They are searching to know who they are in relation to the world in which 
they live. They're searching for a lot of different things. Those things are called good pearls. A lot of them are good pearls, but they're not great. See, because if you root your identity in a relationship and a relationship changes, there's pain regardless. But there is something about ultimate that's different than good. And Jesus is talking in this parable. He's inviting them to ask the question, what are you searching for? Who are you searching for? What are you searching for? Not stumbling, but what is it that you're looking for? And so all the questions that he's being asked, for some of them they're saying, well, I'm looking for justice. And some of them are saying, here's what I'm searching for. I'm searching for you to make that wrong right. Others are saying, I'm searching for healing. Some are saying, I'm searching for you to overthrow Rome. That's what they were searching for. I'm searching for you to rise up. I'm searching. He's pulling out of their hearts. And what he's beginning to say in this context is, I'm not downplaying your search. What I'm here to tell you is there's something greater than all of those things. Will you trust me alone to do what only I can do? Is the pursuit of your life only about search? Or is it also about finding? You see, we as a culture, I've been saying this over and over. I'm going to say it over and over for a year. Because it's something that Jesus has been challenging my my life with strongly. We as a culture, of course we don't value hypocrisy in any way. We detest it. So we value honesty and and genuineness. Usually we value it when it works out towards our favor. Then we don't like it so much on the other side. But we really do value. We want someone to be honest because then we can do something with that. Genuineness. We value those things. But the gospel doesn't place ultimate value only on being genuine. The gospel places ultimate value not only on being authentic and real, but also growing and being transformed to look more like Jesus. And so there's some of us that are searching for things in our lives, and they're beautiful things, they're good pearls. But what Jesus is saying is it's not just being honest about the search, is that when you find him, are you willing to, are you willing to, Give those things up to him so that you can grab something of greater value, of more value of who he is. If you define your life by happiness, you'll find that yourself in your life. If you define the pursuit of your life based on happiness, you'll find yourself often being robbed of joy. But if you define the pursuit of your life on wholeness and holiness which is something that you can't attain outside of what Jesus can do, then you can find that you can actually grab something of more value than that which is just temporary. Yet at some point, following Jesus has to make us look more like Jesus. At some point in our lives, following Him has to, we got to look more like, and that doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it simply means that we begin to look more like Jesus. But the only way we look more like Jesus is when we're willing to let go of some things. And so here you've got a story that he tells about someone who stumbles and finds a treasure, but he's got to sell everything he has. That's consistent. A singular treasure, the response is sell everything you have. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Here he tells the story of a merchant in search of pearls where he finds a singular pearl that has more value than all those things. He sells all he has to obtain this one pearl. These two parables collide in one man's life. You see it. The parables come right to life. He's rich, he's young, and he's a ruler. He's rich, he's young, and he's a ruler. If you pull that metaphor to today, which can be a bit dangerous because we're talking about one person's life, but if we pull it forward a little bit, our culture loves wealth, youth, and power. We love it. Wealth, youth, and power. And so wealth, youth, and power are in this rich, young ruler. And if you go through the Bible and you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, if you want to go fast, go to Mark. If you want to go through it quick, go to Mark. A little more detail, go to Matthew. Uh, if you want a doctor's perspective, go to Luke. All right. 
And then if maybe you're new to follow Jesus, you can start off with John, although John chapter 1 is going to mess you up big time. All right, we always tell new followers of Jesus, read the, read the book of John. Have you read John chapter 1? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and everyone's like, what? That's confusing. I know, just stick with it. Get to John 3, 16, your heart will go, ah. <laughs> Power through the first couple, okay? <laughs> or get in a small group and go, what does this mean? <laughs> so anyways, this rich young ruler, he finds Jesus one day. This rich young ruler is searching, okay? He's searching. And he sees Jesus... And he's got a lot of good things in his life. And Jesus, I'm going to paraphrase it. Jesus essentially says to him, yep, 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 yep. This is good. This is good. This is good. This is really good. Hey, you've answered that really well. Gold, you get a gold star. Well done. But then he says to him, I'm ripping through this story. He says to him, there's one thing you lack. Come on. I mean, my life's goal is to pray to the Lord and have him say, there's one thing you lack. That's my life's goal. I don't know about you, but I got more than one thing I lack. How many know that the more you follow Jesus, the longer the list seems to get? Is that just my experience? The longer you follow Jesus, the more you're like, well, we can work on this, and we can work on this, and we can work on this, and they definitely need to work on that. But we can work on this, and we can work on this. So he says to him, one thing you lack. And what does he say to this rich, young ruler? Sell all you have. Sell all you have and follow me. So parables are not metaphors. He's speaking truth. Sell all you have and follow me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, do you know how many people asked him to follow him? I mean, Jesus is not just good. He's amazing. People would come to him and they'd have a miracle happen in their lives. And you know what Jesus would say? Shh, don't tell anybody about it. But because we're humans, we don't listen to anyone. They'd go blab all about it. They'd turn around. He would say, don't say anything. And the next verse would say, and then they ran into the village telling everything that he had done. Every single time. Okay? Every single time. It wasn't they didn't understand. It's just they had to get the good news out. And oftentimes he would say, no, you can't follow me. You can be a follower of me, but you can't follow me. In other words, you can't be in my inner circle. You can't be one of my disciples. No, no. You go back, serve here. You do this. You do that. You can't. You can't. All the time. But this rich young ruler, he says, no, no, no. One thing you lack. Sell all you have, and you can follow me. You can be in my inner circle. And it says that the rich young ruler calculated all the good things that he had, and he wasn't willing to give any of them up because following Jesus just looked like a field. In comparison to the treasure that he thought he had. Following Jesus, he couldn't see the pearl of great price. All he could see was the cost. He couldn't see the value. He could only see the cost. And because he couldn't see the value of Jesus, the Scripture says that he went away sad. Because he wasn't willing to pay the cost. Not the price. Jesus alone pays that. Last one. Those two go together. This one's a bit weird. In relation to those two. But it's not in relation to all the questions that Jesus was being asked. if you're anything like me, when you watch the news, doesn't your heart sometimes just go, how? Another school shooting? Another genocide? Another injustice? Another case where the evidence seems to follow a conclusion, only what? What were they struggling with? Jesus, if you are who you say you are, then overthrow the Romans. 
get them out. Don't you see what they're doing to your people? Don't you see? Crucifying up to 500 a day? Don't you see what they're doing? If you are who you say you are, then do something. If you're all-knowing, then stop that. You should have done something. If you're all-powerful, then, then do something. And if you're worth following, then you got to show me what that is. All these questions are being just poured out upon them. Jesus is saying to them, sometimes all you're looking at is the field and you're missing the treasure. Sometimes your life can be all about a search of good things and you're not willing to see the ultimate thing. So this is about stumbling. This is about searching. And this one, oh man, this one's hard because this one's about surrender. And in context, now he says this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea, and it gathered fish of every kind. Pause. There is a diversity in Canada that is beautiful. But there is a counterfeit diversity that is not kingdom. And God is going to continue to peel back what it looks like for every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. That if you think Canada is diverse, you wait to see what heaven is like. We ain't all angels on clouds eating Philly cheese, cream cheese, or whatever it is, all white up there. That ain't what it is. Someone asked Jesus one time a question about marriage, and he was, no, no, you don't, you don't, you think marriage is good. You've got no idea what that is. See, because for us, it's all about status. For Jesus, it was something entirely different. So that's just a preview of where we're going in the next season. So buckle up, baby. He gathered fish of every kind. So, so when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. Now he pivots and says, so it will be at the end of the age. Notice he doesn't say that men will judge what is good or bad. He says that there's this, and angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. Now that should make everybody go, oh boy. Because you know what the Scripture says? That none of us are righteous. There's only two options there. I wish there was a third. I wish there was like righteous, evil, and like decent folk. Because then we'd be like, I'm pretty decent. Like maybe not compared to Mother Teresa, but definitely to my Uncle Jerry. I'm better than my Uncle Jerry, okay? Okay. I didn't mean your dad in any way. I was a fictitious Uncle Jerry there, just letting you know. So the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into a fiery furnace. And in that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So now Jesus pivots and he talks about something that's not earthly, something that's eternal. Why is there so much brokenness, sin, and hypocrisy in the world and in the church? If Jesus is all-powerful, why does earth often look more like hell than and it does heaven. And if you're not going to do anything about this, why should I follow you? These are the questions. The kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, how do these go together? The king of this kingdom says, it's up to me to decide what is good or evil, not you. The king of this kingdom says, in the world, you're going to have wheat and tares, beauty and brokenness, justice and injustice, all together. But there will come a day where that will be no more, where every tear will be wiped, and behold, I'm making all things new. You're not making them new. You're joining me in the renewal of all things, but I am making all things new because I am king of this kingdom, not you. 
So he says in this moment, don't miss it. You're going to be tempted in your life when you don't think that God is good. You're going to be tempted in your life to define who God is based on what he does in a moment, but not based on who he has forever declared himself to be. You're going to be tempted in moments to go, God, if you're a God of justice, then you would have done this in my life. And in that moment, the king is saying, have a larger perspective. Trust me, he says in this parable, not one fish will get out from under my net. In other words, nothing is going to escape my gaze. I am a God who sees and knows all absolutely, and there is a time where everything will be understood, everything will be separated, everything will be worked out. And then he uses the example of fish. What is a good fish? A good fish is an alive fish. A bad fish or a foul fish is a dead fish, okay? That's what Jesus says if you read it in the original language. He's not saying, well, this was a good fish because it can count to 10, and this is a bad fish because it can only swim sideways with one fin. (laughs) He's not talking about brokenness. How many know that a fish, a fish with only one fin still tastes the same as this fish? If you went to a fish market for supper, and you were like, mm, I'll take that one that's on ice, or the one over there in the corner lying on the ground with the flies. That one looks pretty good. No. So what does Jesus say as we, as we close, as I stop talking? He says that the king in his kingdom is not whether you're good or better. The king understands one thing. You were either dead to Christ or alive to Christ. You are the judge or you let him be judge. You are the arbiter of what is right or you let him be the arbiter of what is right. And for all of us, that I almost tripped over the, the net. For all of us, that's the challenge when we, to wrestle with that space. So I want you to think about your life as Glenn sings over us. Are you stumbling into treasure? And are you willing to give something up to get hold of who Jesus is? Are you searching for something good? When Jesus says, are you willing to give up what's good for something that's great, something that's ultimate? And lastly, are you willing to trust that the king of this kingdom will one day make all things new? That nothing is escaping his gaze, that he is a God of love, and from his love flows grace and justice not one or the other, both.